So the Lordship of Jesus, um, our friend Matthew Bates uh, helped us all, uh, along with Scott McKnight and many others, N.T. Wright, helped us all recover the royal framework of the New Testament um, and the claims that Scripture make about our King Jesus. Um, I love how this point was echoed in your book uh, with exploring the many gods and the many lords of the Roman pantheon. Um, here, I would love for you to help us see how the Lordship of Jesus defies and is dangerous to these Roman gods. How does the early believers' declaration of the supremacy of Jesus as Lord in Kairos disrupt the powers of Roman religion? Whenever I read the New Testament from the light of some of the things I talk about in Strange Religion, I'm just amazed that Christians survived because they're doing things that are just so um, subversive to the whole Roman way so, for example, um, yes, you have the Roman gods. You also have the Roman emperor. And by the time of the first century, uh, by the time the early Christians are kind of getting going in the middle of the late first century, you have Roman power coalesce around the emperor. So you kind of, you know, the emperor is kind of a new thing in the first century. Um, you had the Senate, you know, the Roman Senate, the Roman Republic, and you transition to this imperial period. Think about Star Wars. This is helpful for people. You think about star wars moving towards this you know one emperor that has all this power and one of the things one of the narratives in the first century was rome's been in decline for a few centuries we had a great glory days at the beginning and now we're kind of starting to see a decline and so there were people that were backing the emperor as kind of the way forward kind of like when hitler came to power they were backing the emperor as the way forward to, for rome's greatness how do we make rome great again and the idea was, let's push all of our chips in on Caesar. And they do that, starting with Caesar Augustus. And one of the things we start seeing, I talk about this a little bit in my book, is the language of allness, the idea of Lord of all. Now, it's interesting, when I was doing research for a strange religion, I thought, okay, Zeus must have been called Lord of all because he's really powerful, Jupiter. And actually, it wasn't very common for any of the Greek or Roman gods or any ancient gods to claim comprehensive supremacy because gods were seen as regional. Think about like sports teams, you know, and they dominate certain regions, that sort of thing. And it's hard to claim, you know, who's the greatest in the whole world. But there was this movement in the first century towards viewing Caesar as the link to pull together all things in the whole world. There would have been a unity between the gods and Caesar. And so then this nobody Jew, <laughs> comes along in the middle of the first century and says, I am Lord of all, like not just Lord of Palestine or Lord of Asia Minor or Lord of Greece or Lord of even Rome, but Lord of all yeah. and creator and judge. Um, this would have been just astounding and would have invited the wrath of the gods. Anybody coming in and claiming, hey, I'm, I'm the boss of everybody is just asking for trouble. So we talked about the Pax de Orem, Peace with the Gods. The, if you infringe upon that, you're in danger of the whole Olympus coming after you in total war and decimation. Mm. Like that's what they would think. If we allow someone to come in and claim supremacy and start to take over territories, like the gods are going to go at war with us. So actually the, the Romans differentiated between religio. Can we welcome a religion in from the outside? that fits within our pantheon, that fits within our system, and superstitio, superstition, foreign gods that don't fit. And they they were very, they policed these things. And here the early Christians came in and they say, we don't compute with you. We don't compute with Roman religion. You, we can't fit in somewhere. We come in and we take over, mm -hmm. but they don't take over with war. They don't take over with weapons. They don't take over with puffing up. They take over with grace and peace and goodness, it's the greatest gamble in the world, Jason, that these yeah. Christians said, we have a plan to take over the world with the fruit of the spirit. Like if you, if they sat down and explained that to a PR person, they'd be like, this is never going to work. Yeah. And it, uh, it's, it's, you brought up that point about the gods, uh, the Roman pantheons, like the sports teams being geographically located, um, in the Roman yeah. mind. And that also fits in kind of with what we're going to move over to next, because uh, you've rightly helped us see how Jesus, Paul, and the New Testament are in conversation with or against the Roman pantheon of gods. 
As we stated earlier, this relates to how the Hebrew scriptures were also in conversation against the rebellious gods of the nations uh, that we know were also Mm -hmm. geographically located. Um, This leads to the territory of two of this channel's favorites. Um, That's the Divine Council worldview and the work of Dr. Michael Heiser. So before we go any further, let me share my screen and share this clip. The Bible asks us to believe a lot of strange things about the spiritual world. At first, we might be tempted to ignore them, but if we say we believe the Bible, we can't avoid these concepts. Much of what we think we know about the spirit world isn't true. It's been filtered down through centuries of church tradition. Angels do not have wings. Demons don't have horns or tails. And for the biblical writers, the unseen realm was home to more than angels and demons. There were other, bigger players. So do you believe what's in your Bible? Did you catch what the Bible asked you to believe? God meets with his heavenly host to decide what happens on earth. These beings, the gods of the council, are spirits, not people or idols. Yahweh, the God of Israel, is an Elohim, a spirit being. But no other Elohim is him. He is one of a kind. He is the true God with a capital G. He alone is the perfect sovereign creator. He is the most high God. Now, Psalm 82, 6 says God has sons. Sons of the most high is the phrase. I have said, you are gods and sons of the most high, all of you. Who are these sons of God? It sounds odd. What about Jesus? How can there be all these other sons of God? Sons of God language made sense to ancient people. God was king and kings assigned their sons high ranking jobs in their government. So it is in the unseen realm. It's important because the sonship language reminds us that God wants a family. His family extends to both the unseen world and to earth. And those two families come together in Eden. So before I lose this thought on that clip, what I keep seeing coming up over and over again is like, like what you just said, there's this um, connection between uh, the, the, the new Testament early followers of Jesus um, in and against uh, the the Greco-Roman pantheon. And then I see that same, so same things coming out with what's happening with the Hebrew scriptures and what's going on there. Um, and I just wondered if you could speak mm-hmm. to that um, and to this clip, and then just tell us about your experience with uh, Dr. Michael Heiser and, and, and your uh, understanding or um, where you're at with the Divine Council worldview. Yeah, um, I, I, I was interviewed by um, Michael, not not long before he passed away, so I'm sorry that um, that his passing happened. Um, but but uh, had great interactions with him. I knew him from his work with Logos and other things. Um, and I know the value of his work with the Unseen Realm. I, honest confession, I haven't read his book, even though it's been recommended to me a million times. What I will say is um, we have a great barrier in our Christian understanding today, often in America of trying to even understand or imagine kind of the spiritual realm. Um, I've learned a lot from my Pentecostal colleagues um, to appreciate that more. But, you know, I look at a text like Ephesians that talks about kind of this war we're we're, uh, waging um, against not just flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers and so forth. I think we have to, you know, I actually go to Galatians chapters five and six. Paul says, flesh and spirit are mortal enemies. They're constantly at war with each other. And then I think it's chapter five, verse 17, he says, and what you want to do, you know, you can't. And I think what he's saying there is, we think every day when I wake up, I'm just sort of making my decision of what to eat, what to do and where to go saying, you don't understand, there's this whole other thing going on (laughs) that you can't see it going on, but it's flesh and spirit that are at battle, at war. And I think he's saying you need spiritual perception to to understand these things are influencing you. And you need to either follow the spirit. There's no neutral, I guess is what Paul's saying in Galatians 5. He says, there's no neutral. There's no Switzerland, I'm independent. There's no independence. Either you're going to be pulled in by gravity to the flesh or you're going to make a choice to walk with the spirit. 
and there's no in between. I think when I hear Heiser talk about that and some of those statements, when I go to Paul, that's what I see is there's the, there's this great battle going on, and Paul's going to tie in you know these Greek and Roman gods to that. Um, I love the screw tape letters. C.S. Lewis is the screw tape letters. He has this great saying at the beginning, as Lewis does, where he says, um, we need to be afraid of the materialist who only believes in what's material and doesn't take seriously spiritual powers. He says we also need to be concerned with the magician that's obsessed with only the spiritual things and, and is kind of overly obsessed with the spirits and powers almost to, to a fault or to a neglect of the things on earth. And, and Lewis really encourages us to find a way to understand how the two things interact together. I think that's really helpful. Yeah. And I think what happens in our Western world, though, is that we seem to be more on the other side, not the magician side of that Lewis quote. And what Heiser right. helped us do is help bring some of that balance back to really seeing scripture on its own terms. And I love that you brought in the quote for the battle between flesh and spirit, because I've never really thought about it that way. Um, and mm -hmm. understanding that, you know, as behind the scene, the powers as well. So that's thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm.